I bring you guys uh, greetings from the promised land world sector, amen? And uh, Aaron and Charmaine wanted me to also tell you hi as well, amen? And you'd be so proud of one of your own, Nick Infantino, who led the uh, mission team to Bahrain in the Middle East. A predominantly Muslim country, they just had their inaugural service this last Friday with 11 disciples on the team and only seven visiting disciples. They had 67 in attendance in that Muslim country. Is that pretty awesome? And it's been very encouraging of what God's doing all over the Northeast United States. You know, Chanel and I uh, came back to Boston. We had led the church previously in 2020, and the church was around 50 members. But as God would have it, the Lord put on our heart to grow the church in one year to 120 disciples, amen? Because, you know, 120 is a good number in Acts chapter 1. And God grew the church to 120, amen? Then that next year, it got, uh, at the beginning of the year, to 140, and then we planted three churches, amen? We saw Providence, Rhode Island planted, Manchester, New Hampshire, and Portland, Maine. And many of you guys are going, I have no idea where that's at, but amen. <laughs> Excitingly, all three of those church plantings have a baptism today, amen. And we've been so inspired, and pray we're planting Burlington, Vermont here, and then we will officially have completed all of our territory with Operation Eagle, amen. You know, we've been very inspired, though. For me, the, the, the reason the church has grown is because we've imitated the San Francisco church's faith. Yeah. And uh, Jason Dimitri, from the very beginning, was someone I would call and get advice from, and I would just do whatever he said, yeah. and it worked out. Amen? <laughs> and that's the power of imitation. And, man, Fernando did the best sermon I have heard in years at the ICLS this past yeah. week. I was like... Whoa, this is awesome. And, you know, uh, I appreciate the COPS program and how it's inspired so many of us in the Northeast. Uh, these are principles we practice, though we may call the name something a little different, amen. But we practice it, and it's inspired the entire movement of God. And so I'm honored to speak to you guys because you guys are my heroes. I, I pray I can say something that sticks today with you. And I think it's going to be awesome. Let's go to our God in prayer. Father, before we get in your word, Lord, we want to ask you to give us an undivided heart to you. We know right now there are demons that are going to try to tempt people to not take notes. Going to try to pull people away to think about Burger King or McDonald's or whatever. And Father God, in, in all seriousness, I, I pray that our worship is the reverence that you deserve for dying on the cross for us this morning. Send your holy angels around this hotel room right now, Father God, and allow your spirit to use me. If there's something I plan, God, that's not of you, shut me up. But if there's something that's supposed to be said, Father God, that wasn't planned, you speak it through me. Change us, Father. Help us to become more like your son, more like Christ. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. amen. Now, I want to take a, a little vote this morning here, amen? We don't do voting a lot in the kingdom, amen, but here we'll do one. You got three different options today. I have no idea what the church is going through or anything, so I'm just kind of coming in fresh. So I want a little bit of input here. We could have, number one, a, a really visionary, inspiring sermon where we feel like we want to go out and take the world, amen? Number two, we could have a deep theological type kind of sermon where we learn a lot about the word of God and grow in our knowledge for without knowledge, God's people are destroyed, the Bible says. Or third, we could just have an unrestrained, lay it out about sin, who cares, unfiltered sermon, okay? So let's take a vote. Number one, do you want the visionary one? Okay, a few people. Okay. Number two, do you want the theological one? Deep dive in the Bible, okay. Number three, do we want the unfiltered one? Who cares? Okay. Title of the sermon then is going to be Sin's Dire Consequences. You can turn your Bibles to Psalm 73. Sin's Dire Consequences. You know, I think we preach a lot about evangelism. We preach a lot about discipleship. 
which are the very core things that are being restored in our generation right now. But how much do we really preach hard on sin and its dire consequences? All sin separates us from God. We learned that in the light and darkness study. But not all sin is equal. Some people go, oh, all sin's the same. That is just a bunch of garbage from the pit of hell. In fact, the Bible teaches that all sin is not equal. There's sins against the body. Some people are going to be punished with more blows than others. This is a biblical concept that we're going to dive into today, and you've got to understand the dire consequences of what sins you do and what sins that are involved in your life. God punishes sin. So all sin separates, but not all sin is equal in its sinfulness. There are consequences. We understand Hebrews 2.2 2 says, Every violation and disobedience received its just punishment. God punishes sin. Romans 6.23, we know the wage of sin is eternal death. And we know hell fire is promised for those who have not repented of their sins and obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, God punishes Christians, I believe, more than he does the world in this life. Think about it. God disciplines his children because he cares about us. It'd be weird if I, like, disciplined Fernando's kids. You know what I mean? Like, I just go over there. I'm like, okay, you go on timeout or whatever. That, and they're like, I don't even know who you are, amen? And, and God, and, and, you know, maybe in an extreme situation, and, and I, I don't know who the kid is, they're just running the street, I might do something. So sometimes God intervenes in the world. But we are God's children, and so he chastens us, he disciplines us, he punishes us so that we can become more godly. Are you with me right here? Uh, I, I love the word of God. And the word of God has got to be our standard. And today, I'm going to say some things that might challenge you a little bit. You might be visiting, it might offend you a little bit, amen? But we've got to get into it. You know, I love Psalm 73 because sometimes we struggle looking at the world and, and we seemingly think that the world is just enjoying their sin, that they're just having a good time. And the writer of the Psalm says, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. I mean, you guys ever just been driving, you know, you're, 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 or maybe you're like taking the train or the bus somewhere. And you just see that guy p pull up in that, that nice car right next to you. And they're just enjoying their life. They're shredded. They're coming back from the gym, you know, and you're just kind of like on your way to midweek. And you're going, what am I doing with my life? Anyone ever relate to that? Like, like, like this is just madness. Like, it's either a date night, it's either a Devo, it's either a midweek, or it's either Bible talk. And these guys just party and they make their own schedules, they do whatever they want. Man, they're prospering. And this is what the psalmist is struggling with. It's the idea that sin, sin seems fun. It, it, it brings momentary pleasure, but it can cause a lifetime of pain. Now when we look down in verse 13, he's struggling, surely in vain have I kept my heart pure? And have washed my hands in innocence? All day long, I've been afflicted. Every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. He goes, if I would have talked like that, like, man, the world has it better, I betrayed God's people. I brought insult into the kingdom. And then in verse 17, he goes, it's till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood. It's our final destiny, Amen. You see, by getting in the word of God, by entering his sanctuary, we understand the final destiny of the world and eternity in hell. And though being a disciple is harder than being a non-Christian, being a disciple is more joyful than being a non-Christian. Are you with me right here? I love that you guys have the passage behind me here. That's our church's slogan, life to the full, amen? And I, I just thought that was a God right there. I was fired up about that. But you know... Sometimes we don't talk about the natural consequences of sin. What do I mean? Our first point is the built-in punishment of sin. So I, this is not a sermon on God's wrath and striking down with lightning bolts and hell when you die. Amen? Amen. We're going to talk about what are just the consequences of sin itself. You know, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6. Many 
many times bad things happen, but it isn't really God punishing you. It's just the nature of the sin itself. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18, the Bible says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. He goes, whoever sins sexually, the built-in punishment is that your own body suffers. We see this with AIDS and STDs. And he goes, you are sinning against your physical body. And so I want to talk about the built-up punishments of sin. If you have a laptop, for example, sometimes it has a built-in microphone, right? Or a built-in camera or webcam. And it means that the laptop comes with that. And so we're talking about what comes with the sins that we choose to do as a consequence, as a dire consequence. we got to stop saying sin is fun. Even when we present it to people like, yeah, it's fun in the moment stuff. You're going to see today it's not fun. This is something that will destroy your life. Amen. You know, Galatians chapter 6. We're going all over the Bible here today. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Well, you voted for it, man. Galatians 6. Now, I had a feeling you guys would vote for that one, so I know. If you didn't, I, I would have been in trouble. I had to pull up another sermon, so. Galatians 6, verse 8, it says, Whoever sows to please their flesh, from that flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. There's this principle, this law, that's just as true as the law of gravity, that if you sow, you plant seeds in the mind, you plant seeds in your soul of sin, that sin itself will fight back at you. It will cause you to reap destruction in your own life. So there is punishment from sin in this world, but oftentimes it's the sin itself. The book of Proverbs is really interesting. Proverbs, uh, people get confused, isn't, isn't a book of promises? Like we read a proverb, for example, train a child in the way they should go, and when you know years later they'll come back. And, and Proverbs is a book of probabilities. And so most likely that's what's going to happen. They're not fact promise every single time. But the probability is if you raise your kid in the kingdom of God, they're going to come back in time. Are you with me right here? And so we're going to see as we read some of these different probabilities that as we look at these built-in sins, we're going to look at sexual morality. We're going to look at drunkenness. We're going to look at drug use. We're going to get into all this stuff. But as we get into them, you might go, well, that won't happen to me. I'm the exception. I don't get an STD when I sin like that. But you know, don't make the exception the rule. You're just playing with fire. And at the end, you're going to be burning fire for eternity anyway. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, amen. If you're one of those few that escaped these built-in punishments or whatever, um, that, that's missing the point. Fear the Lord, the Bible says, and you will be wise. You'll, you'll live a long life. Again, did all the apostles live long lives? No. But it, the probability is, is if you live a godly life, you're probably not going to go to jail. Probably not going to get the death sentence for murdering somebody. It's just the built-in blessings of following God. And that'll be the second point later. But we're talking about the built-in punishment, amen? Now, before we can get into this, you got to understand sin is a choice. Not something you're born with like the religious world, like it's some disease or something. It's breaking God's law. And we get so faked out. I fall into it. I mean, they go, oh, man, Satan's really attacking me today. I go, really? Like he's attacking you specifically? This fallen angel that rebelled in heaven came to your house and attacked you. I think there's other things in the Ukraine maybe going on or maybe the Middle East that are probably have his attention. I fell into sin. I mean, how I, I many brothers do you know, I fell into impurity today? You know what I mean? Like, sometimes we don't help each other. We're like, yeah, you know, I understand, bro. It's about, you know, we, we get this weak sauce view of sin. I, imagine like, I fell into car theft today. I was just walking by this car and I just, you know what I mean? It'd be ridiculous. If you're like me, one thing I struggle with is when I confess my sin, I like to tell stories. And you're kind of like setting it up so it's not as bad. Like, bro, I got to be open. You won't believe this was crazy today what happened. This girl walked by me and it was so... And you're just a victim. 
is going, I chose to break God's law. And you got to be ready for the built-in punishment that might come from it. Uh, Satan is so smart. He's, he's changed the language in our society. Uh, don't, don't call yourself a Christian and you use the term LGBTQ community. The Bible calls it homosexual. King James sodomite. We don't go about the pornographers. Well, he's part of the adult entertainment community, the, the, the AEC community. We say things like, oh, that guy had an affair and his wife. An affair. An affair is like what I'm doing here in San Francisco, having a fun time. You know, you go out on a vacation or something, right? No, he's an adulterer. We, we don't create some, you know, the C-O-Y-W, cheat on your wife community or something. She just has an eating problem. It's called gluttony. And hey, listen, you can get mad at me, but the word of God, you don't use Bible language, you're not going to change. You're not going to change. And we wonder why people get fall away. People fall away because they never hated their sin. And they go, oh, well, we got to really inspire them and love them. And you're going to, they got to be, amen. But you got to send the bad news and how wicked that sin is if you're going to transform and change. We have lost the preaching against sin in this generation, which is what truly changes hearts. Anytime there's a revival in the Old Testament, it started with the destruction of idols. It wasn't like, whoa, let's just get excited. Let's just go change the world. No, destroy the idols. And the presence of God comes. And we need to get rid of this sentimental garbage. And using the terms that the world uses, if we're going to understand. Now, what are the built-in punishments of sin? Well, let's talk about sexual immorality first. Amen. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. In chapter 5, in verse 18... Proverbs 5, excuse me, verse 8, says, Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you lose your honor to others and your dignity to one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich the house of another. At the end of your life, you will groan when you are flesh and your body are spent. It doesn't say God will, you know, Strike. It says, no, you're, you're just going to groan. It's the built-in punishment of yeah. sexual immorality. Your flesh and your body are spent. Verse 12, you'll say, how I hated discipline. How my heart spurned connect correction. I would not obey my teachers or turn my ear to my instructors. We need discipling. Amen, church. Yeah. As I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. Whew. Sin destroys your life. If sexual immorality was dealt with, a lot of people go with they try to have these sex education things, use a condom, you know, take this, we got this pill now where homos can now have sex with each other and it's not going to be a disease. There's all this garbage out there. And at the end of the day, the Bible says, listen, there's a built-in punishment. Your flesh is going to be destroyed. There would not be single moms. Abortions. The true key to overcoming this stuff is repentance. And live in the way God intended to. You know, in chapter 6, verse 25, the Bible says here in verse 25, do not lust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes. For a prostitute can be had for a loaf of bread, but another man's wife preys on your very life. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger when he is starving. Yet if he is caught, he must pay sevenfold, though it cost him all the wealth of his house. But a man who commits adultery has no sense. Whoever does so destroys himself. Blows and disgrace are his lot, and his shame will never be wiped away, for jealousy arouses a husband's fury, and he will show no mercy when he takes revenge. He will not accept any compensation when he will refuse a bribe, however great it is. Wow. Do you see the, the built-in punishments? Yeah. Uh, I mean, adultery is one of those things even the world, right. even the world yeah. looks at in a negative light. Right. Yeah. I remember I was on Facebook a couple months ago, and you know how you get those advertisements that come up or whatever. Yeah. And sometimes I get these leadership advertisements about speaking and things like that. 
And one comes up with Bill Clinton. And, you know, it's a leadership class that Bill Clinton's teaching on how to be effective on leadership. And, and let's be honest, if, if I told you, hey, Bill Clinton's coming here today and going to teach us some leadership principles, uh, I don't know about you, but I'd probably go, you know, it'd, it'd be pretty cool. You go, wow, he's a great leader. I learned some things. But I, I was excited. I was like, you know what? I love reading the comments. Yeah. This is always some really funny one at the, at the top, you know what I mean? I was like, this is going to be good. Yeah. This is going to be good. And, you know, I click on the comments, and, of course, everyone's letting him have it about the whole Monica Lewinsky situation and the adultery that was committed. And it just shows this is a guy that will never live this down. Yeah. It, it, it's going to follow him until he dies. Yeah. That was the built-in punishment because he lacked sense. Lacked sense. I mean, this is terrible. Think about this passage. It says that someone's husband can get enraged and kill you. Because you cheated on your wife. I love watching Unsolved Mysteries. One of my favorite shows. And it's really cool because it's like from the 80s and 90s. So they're all like, a lot of them are solved now. So you're like, I try to guess what's happening. And at the end, they have an update. You know what I mean? Uh, but, you know, I can't tell you how many people kill their spouse. And I'm just like, what in the world? Built-in punishment of sexual morality. You know, the CDC says half of all new STDs reported each year are among young people 15 to 24. Wow. Nearly 46% of sexually active high school students did not use a condom the last time they had sex. Sorry, this is raw today, by the way, guys. All right, good. Got Kids Kingdom if you need to take them there, amen? You know, it's crazy. Of the, the 36,801 new HIV diagnoses in the U.S. and dependent areas in 2019, 69% of them were among the gay and bisexual population. San Francisco is the hub of. The homosexual community only compromises 2 to 5% of the, the United States. But they're very loud and evangelistic. Cohabitation before marriage has been shown to produce more divorces when you do studies. Sexual sin, why? It's a sin against the body. Play out the scenario for a moment. An adulterous person destroys themselves, but imagine someone being a, a prostitute. What type of people go and see a prostitute? Are they your salt of the earth type people and they're, they're good, moral, upright people? And again, there might be an exception. You go, well, I, you know, I'm a good person. I just, you know. No, the, this type of people that they go and see usually beat them. Now we know why Jesus had so much compassion on prostitutes. I mean, think of the type of life. And sometimes they're human trafficked. And you go, Mike, why are you talking about prostitution? I, you know, I, I struggle with sexual morality, but I'm not selling myself. Well, you're giving it for free. And from a biblical perspective, from a biblical perspective, it's the same thing. Being a prostitute, let me redefine prostitute for us. Sexually immoral yeah. will result in getting diseases, getting beaten, in some cases murdered, because they're sleeping with a bunch of violent freak weirdos. And this is why Jesus had compassion of them. Hollywood doesn't show you that. Hollywood doesn't show you that. I mean, I, I love the movie Titanic. And, uh, you know, it's just, I'm just one of those romantic hearts. You know, I watch them like, this is so moving. <laughs> But you know, it's so deceptive. It kind of takes you in and you're like, don't realize like, wow, this like woman's like cheating on her husband to go like be with this dude. And, and, and you know, but it captures you. You know what I mean? You got movies back in the past about prostitutes and like Pretty Woman and Julia Roberts and like it's all good. No, that is like a lie. Satan uses Hollywood to brainwash people. Sleeping around, get you a kid. Worse yet, an abortion. Wow. So, uh, this, is, this is the punishment. Pornography. Yeah. Pornography. Uh, I can speak from experience. This, this was my key sin. And it destroys your brain. I mean, to this day, it, it's just like your brain is warped. You never forget these images. They're written in your brain. They've actually scanned brains of people that are addicted to pornography and compared it with people who are on heroin 
and it releases the same reward sep receptors, and the brain scans look the same. And this is the new drug. It's a drug that a lot of churches don't even talk about. Because they just go, oh, there's no way we can overcome it. There's no way we can change. But it's sad. I can't tell you how many married couples I've talked to. I'm just not attracted to my spouse anymore. I'm just not attracted to my spouse anymore. I mean, how is it that a guy like Tiger Woods goes and sleeps, and he's dating a model. And we go, wow, gee, look at the girl he's dating. That's awesome. And they cheat on him. Cardi B's husband it cheats on her. You know what I'm saying? And you kind of go, this doesn't make sense. Yeah, they've warped their brain. It's the built-in punishment. They've warped their brain. Many of the uh, famous serial killers, Ted Bundy, uh, Richard Ramirez, John Wayne Gacy, and uh, Jeffrey Dahmer all profess to porn addiction. In fact, they did say 95% of serial killers have confessed to porn addiction. Because it, it, it deadens the brain, and you don't have any value for human life anymore. And so you're like looking at women as objects or men, if you struggle with that as objects or whatever, and eventually it just kind of goes to this place like, I need something more for that adrenaline rush. I need something more to, to get that high. So here's the thing. If you want to be a psychopath one day, jump into the world of porn, okay? Proverbs 5, chapter 5, verse 15. You know, it's awesome to see uh, my best friend, uh, Jeremiah, and his awesome bride, Brianna, get married. Amen. And uh, Jeremiah's uh, mother is with him today. And uh, if you get a chance, be sure to uh, greet her. You've done an incredible job raising a, a, a man who fears the Lord. And uh, one of my best friends who's helped keep me faithful over the years. And this verse is so inspiring when you think about marriage in Proverbs 5, verse 15. Now, singles, you might need to just guard your heart. But it's in the Bible, amen. Verse 15. Drink water from your own sister and running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice with the wife of your youth. And the marriage can read verse 19 if you want. Like, but. <laughs> this passage, it just says, listen, be happy with your wife. Be happy with your husband. Sometimes the grass looks greener on the other side because we're not watering our own grass. We're, we're not pouring into our spouses. The thing is, if you're overloaded with all these images, it's going to destroy your marriage. It's a built-in punishment. How about drunkenness? Proverbs 23. How about drunkenness? Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine, do not gaze at wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup and when it goes down smoothly. In the end, God strikes you down like a snake. Is that what it says? In the end, it bites, built in punishment, like a snake, and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind will imagine confusing things. You will be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on the top of a rigging. They hit me, you will say, but I'm not hurt. They be beat me, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? Woo! Drunkenness. How many things have you done that you regret when you've drank too much? You wake up by people you don't even know? Bruises on your body that you're not sure how you got? Maybe you fell down, maybe you got in a fight. And yet, what's the world tell us? When you see the Super Bowl commercials and stuff, and you see these ripped, shredded guys drinking these beers, right? And all the sexy bikini-clad women like dancing around them like, this is the life, you know? <laughs> they don't show the beat-up, bruised guy stumbling around, abusing his children coming home. <laughs> Buy this. It bit them. You know, beer is made out of hops and it has a, a, what's called a... a estrogen mimickers in it that cause you to be more feminine. 
and uh, you want to drink beer nonstop, you're going to get the beer belly. You get the man boobs. You're going to get all that stuff. And you're going to be effeminate. I look around at our nation right now, I go, oh, hey amen, there are a lot of people drinking beer. But you're not going to see that on the beer commercial. It's not inspiring. It destroys your mind and your brain. And you go, well, God have to punish you. Well, yeah, he'll punish you, but he could, the built-in punishment's enough. You have to get a DUI, right, to get it. How many have seen someone just drunk and there's, you know, peeing on your couch or something crazy? You know what I mean? Like, it's just disgusting. Um, not to mention it destroys your liver. Destroys your liver. Let's talk about a sin that no Christian, true Christian could ever commit. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. So this would only apply to visitors. If you think you're a Christian and you're doing this, then you're not. Uh, Romans 1, I'll explain, the scripture's going to say it, I'll explain the scriptures before you get freaked out here. Romans chapter 1, verse 26, we're just getting the Bible, amen? A little bit of a different sermon here, but verse 26 says, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust, even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. So you say, well, because of what? Well, beforehand it talked about how their thinking became futile, and it started by looking at images. It went down this rabbit hole, and it became more and more depraved, to now homosexuality is being practiced. And in verse 27, it says, in the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. You know, the penalty of unrepented sin is homosexuality. You read all of Romans 1, that's when God gives you over. You can't be a Christian in that sin. It, it, it's the penalty. It's the curse, if you will, of unrepented perversion. Is that what your Bible says? On, you know, um, there are 50 more times, as I said earlier, to develop AIDS than those who are straight. But it's interesting. The Church of Satan came out with something interesting recently. They said over 50% of its members identify as LGBTQ, what the Bible calls homosexuals. Wow. Over 50%. These people are so evil, it's never enough. Let's legalize gay marriage. Okay, done. Now it's getting to your kids. Let's make sure they know about it and are taught about this stuff. Now it's getting to companies and politicians. Throw a rainbow flag out there and we'll get more business because we support these guys, these perverts. Next, what's going to be next? Pedophilia. Why are suicide rates higher in homosexual communities? Well, it's because they get bullied by the people that don't believe it. No, it's because they're perverted and they're twisted in their thinking and their minds. It's sad. There was this fake Christian group that go out to a pride parade and had a sign. They go, we want to apologize. Put themselves around a bunch of perverts and go, we want to apologize for the way that Christians have treated you. The Bible says these people are God haters. And they're out to destroy. Satan is out to destroy your families. Disney. You get ready. You get ready. It's not the magical kingdom anymore. It's the gay kingdom. I mean, this is the stuff that they're trying to promote. A new Buzz Lightyear movie with some homosexual suggestion in it. And, you know, they kind of a meeting uh, at an office uh, that they, they found a recording where they're actually planning this LGBTQ agenda that they're going to push forward. It's sick. The, you know, the average homosexual has 50, anywhere from 50, depending what study you look at, 50 to 500 sexual partners in a lifetime. Let me give you some perspective. The average straight man has six to 10 in a lifetime. You know, we all witnessed uh, Will Smith uh, get angry and come forward and uh, slap Chris Rock up there, amen? And some felt he was defending his wife's honor. Others argued, how could, how could he do that? It's so wrong. 
But no one talks about the fact that his wife was a prostitute, an adulterer. I'm just using biblical language. And he condones it. This guy's not a role model. I just saw like a defeated man. Stripped of his manhood. He had his chance. My wife shared her faith with him at UCLA uh, many years ago. She didn't have a card on her, so she invited him to Women's Day, but amen. <laughs> Guys, all I'm saying is, is we need to have a biblical conviction about manhood. And, and, and what's, who's a man and who's a woman? Are you with me right here? What about cheating? You ever cheat in school? Take shortcuts? You ever cheat? Plagiarize? We had someone recently in ICCM. Got open, they plagiarized their papers and graduated. Oh, wow. Woo! And, the, and they struggle to be a leader, but, but the challenge is, is you go, well, you take shortcuts. There's always built in punishments to cheating. You don't learn what you actually learn. I'll never forget, I had a disciple, was a sharp dude, you know, and he, and he got this job and he came to me and goes, Mike, I lied on my resume about what I could do. And the job they gave me, I know nothing about. <laughs> well, there's going to be some built-in punishment you're going to experience coming up. We live in a bare minimum of society. You guys want to be bare minimum Christians? Just get it done. Just show up at church. I mean, isn't that what our society is all about? At the gym, you ever seen people do, they do the half reps, you know? Oh, no. Oh, no. Cheating themselves. How about the athletes that pump themselves with the steroids and stuff, you know? And man, it may look good for a little bit, but you end up shriveled up and all kinds of bad things can happen I won't get into, amen? Coveting, amen? Sitting around, I had a different job, I had a different wife, I had a different this, that, I had a PS5, whatever. What's the bill in punishment for coveting? Just being miserable. You ever seen disciples just that, you know, sucks all the faith out of the room. Their sin is their coveting. Because godliness with contentment is great gain. Happiness is not based on what you have. It's based on being content with what you have. That means you can be happy dirt poor, amen? How about drug use? You just write down Galatians 5, 19 through 21. You know that. Acts of the sinful nature, obvious, sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, blah, 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 blah. And it goes, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right. How you live matters. And we go, oh, that's written to non-Christians. No, it's not. Right. We read it and for, to help non-Christians understand what sin is. Right. But that's written to a church. Yeah. And he's going, listen, if you live like this, you're not going to make it. Right. You're not going to make it. It's how you live. Now, there's a word in there, witchcraft which comes from a, a Greek word, pharmakeia. You might think of, you know, the CVS pharmacy or something, right? <laughs> pharmakeia. And it means that any self, anything that alters your state of mind, anything that alters your state of mind, even smoking destroys the temple of God's spirit. And slow, smoking is just a slower form of suicide. If someone smokes, you go, bro, you're struggling with suicide. Like, you pick up the pack, it literally says on the pack, this will kill you. <laughs> well, you drink Coca-Cola and it's got caffeine in it, bro. On, bro. Really? I mean, come on. That does not alter any, it does not, there's no label on there that's going to kill you if you drink Coke. One of the oldest women in the world, they asked her, how'd she live so long? She goes, I drink a Dr. Pepper a day. Yeah. Like, Amen! Yeah. Not saying that's wise health advice or anything like that, so please don't take it. Smoking will give you lung cancer. I mean, I've had family members die because they smoked. Stomach cancer. Drug use, they go, oh, well, you know, what about smoking weed? You know, they call it a gateway drug for a reason. A lot of people go, you know, no, it's not, you know, because, again, the exception, right? But let the exceptions deal with God on the final day of judgment. We're warning ourselves about the built-in punishments right now. 
There's a guy who studied the Bible in uh, Los Angeles. I'll never forget. He studied all the way. I, I met the guy in the fellowship. He studied all the way to counting the cost. And that weekend, he goes out and goes, you know something? I'm getting baptized on Sunday. Let me just give it one more go at the drugs. He overdosed and died the day before his baptism. The brothers were shook. I mean, it was just so intense. But he thought he could play around with the grace of God. The grace of God will not be insulted. Uh, people can get drug-induced psychosis. Um, this can happen when you take too much of a certain drug. And everyone's body's different. Some people, uh, the first time they do something, it could be life-threatening. Life-threatening. The level of toxicity provokes a paranoia in psychotic episodes. You ever walk around the streets and you see these people, you know what I mean, talking to themselves, and you're kind of like, what is going on? Drugs. But we laugh, but you and I could be that. People report feeling like bugs are crawling on them. Yeah. And they'll literally scratch their skin all up because of these drugs. Yeah. And no one wakes up one day, I want to be a drug junkie one day. That's my goal. No, no one, no one starts off with life like that. Yeah. They all think they can manage the built-in punishments of sin. But they don't realize they're sowing to the flesh, and so it destroys them. And maybe it starts with weed. Maybe it starts with drinking. But these things won't make you happy. Yeah. It's just destroying yourself. You may think that won't happen to you, or what about celebrity so-and-so who does his podcast and smokes weed all the time? You know, that, that kind of stuff is Satan's trick and lie to get you to destroy your life. I mean, how many potheads do you know that changed the world? Like, all my friends that, that did that kind of stuff is just like, they're total losers. Total losers. I wrap things up here soon, but the, the punishment of marijuana use is it changes your mood, it alters your senses, it's witchcraft, it invites demonic activity, that's a whole other sermon, uh, impaired body movement, difficult thinking, delusions. Uh, a study in New Zealand conducted in part by uh, researchers at Duke University showed that people who started smoking marijuana heavily, heavily in their teens had got ongoing marijuana use disorder and they lost an average of eight IQ points between the ages of 13 and 38. And they lost mental abilities that didn't fully return in those who had quit marijuana as adults. Those who started smoking marijuana as adults didn't show uh, notable IQ declines. So Christian or not, these are just built-in punishments. It's called dope for a reason. It releases the chemical in your brain, dopamine, that becomes addictive, the same one that pornography releases as well. So people who suffer psychosis have simply had too much of this chemical. Um, people can actually believe, I, I know one guy who believed like Paris Hilton was like in love with him. Yeah. He's like, oh yeah, that's my wife, we love each other, we're in a relationship and stuff. Drugs. <laughs> Delusion. It was one of the biggest promoters of weed. This guy was a disciple for a while. Paris Hilton, that's my wife. You can believe that, that's crazy. Proverbs chapter 6, go over there. What about laziness? Oh boy. Is this a sin here or something? Okay, all right. I think I found it. All right, Proverbs chapter 6. On a little sin hunt today, man. <laughs> all right, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6. Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. As no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in the summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. You know, the Bible uses all of creation to teach us about him. And he says here, learn from the ant. It has no overseer. You go, well, yeah, it does, bro. It has the queen ant. Okay, well, it's making the point, though, that the queen doesn't need to go, you know, travel down the little dirt hole there, knock at one of the ants' doors. Hey, it's time to get up and start doing your job. No, they're self-motivated. A lazy person waits around for their discipleship partner 
to call them to any type of action. You know, what's a built-in punishment for laziness? Having no money. It's a natural punishment. We should all be able to give in God's kingdom. and You should be able to take your friends out after church and pay for their meals. You, you should have funds. I'm not saying we're going to be rich, but you should be generous. There's just no way someone sitting at home all day with their headset on, playing video games, talking to their buddy in Korea, is going to be a world changer. It's just not going to happen. And I'll tell you the built-in punishment. I know a lot of those types of people. I'll tell you the built-in punishment. Depression. Pornography, because they're sitting in front of a TV all day. Tiredness. I believe it's a sin to hit the snooze button. Because you lack integrity with what you said you were going to do. And you don't know why you come into church tired and, and you know, you're, you're, you're failing exams and staying up till 2 a.m. watching Game of Thrones or whatever. On, chapter 26. You guys want to see? Let's see if this guy's inspiring. In chapter 26. Let's see if this is a person we want to imitate our lives after here. Chapter 26 and verse 13. A sluggard says, there's a lion in the road. A fierce lion roaming in the streets. As a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns on its bed. A sluggard buries his hand in the dish, but he's too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. A sluggard is wiser in their own eyes than seven people who answer discreetly. Isn't that so true? You try to disciple these people, like, well, you don't know. I watched on YouTube this video that explained, and you're trying to explain something. And it's like, dude, no, the earth is not flat, dude. Like, you, you, you're possessed by your TV. You're possessed by your computer. And it says it's like someone that, that goes to eat their Captain Crunch in the morning and they, they put their hand to the bowl. Can you imagine this? Peanut butter kind is the best. Yeah. Put your hand to it and you're just like, <sighs> not today. That's the image. The Bible uses some humor, amen? That's the image that's being used. And these people, they want handouts. They want hand. I think it's really hard to be homeless in America. Yeah. I think it's really hard to be homeless in America. Um, these are the people that come to the church and they go, I can't pay my rent. And you know, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul qualified who gets benevolence from the church. Widows who have first gone to their families for help and are 65 and older. So what's that mean for a 25-year-old who can't pay his cell phone bill? Gluttony. What about gluttony? I'll let you guys study that one out. You can, you can, I, I won't go there. The built-in punishment, high blood pressure, weight gain. What about the sins of omission? Not sharing your faith. You forget what you have in Christ. And this might be a shocker, but your ministry doesn't grow. I know, you don't share your faith, your ministry doesn't grow. And it's not like God's like, I'm putting a spiritual block here so that no baptism can go. No, it's just like a numbers game. You share more with people, the built-in blessing, more people come. You don't share with anybody, nobody comes. People always ask me, hey, Mike, what's the secret, you know, to campus ministry? I like to ask why in this last week, how many people did you like really share your faith? I do it in love, you know, you know, we're talking person, we're a loving person. But I, I just I go, how many people have you done shared your faith with this week? Uh maybe one or two. Well, that's just not gonna cut it. And you're asking for some secret, but you're not even doing what the Bible says. I appreciate Smoot was uh, in our campus ministry in Orlando. And uh he, he was reminding me, he comes up today, and he's like, uh, bro, I just want to thank you. I remember when you got there at first, we had arrived to the remnant group, and Smoot was part of it. And so I pulled in some of the singles in the campus, and there's about seven of us. And I said, listen, okay, we're going to go out, and we're going to share our faith uh, with uh, 100 of people a day or something like that. And I remember Smoot went out, and he shared his faith. I remember during the good news, he came back, he's like, he's just so fired up. He's like, I've never done this before. I shared with over 100 people. Yeah. And he was telling me, he said, at one point... And one of the days in the campaign, he was tempted to quit, 
and he shared his faith with the one more guy. It's like the 67th guy, because I think we had the leader share with 100 and ask the, the students to share with 50 or something like that. He shares with the 67th guy, and that guy is Aaron Antoine, who gets baptized, and he was an intern down in the Sages World Sector. Is that pretty awesome? But the built-in blessing of sharing our faith. Um, I think sometimes we get superstitious. We go on a witch hunt. Who's in major sin in this Bible talk that's blocking this from, you know, having the fruit and the growth that we need? And at the end of the day, guys, I don't believe. Have you ever seen someone totally wicked baptize someone? You know what I mean? Like, you're just kind of like, how did that guy do that? And he was just like immoral this week, you know? Or, or you see someone get up there and, and they're, they're, you know, we have a, a guy. He's a new Christian. He, he's, <laughs> hey, man, he'll probably listen to this, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> And it's so funny because he's just like in all this major sin all the time. We're trying to help him. You know, he's brand new, fresh out of the world. He lives like an hour away from the church. But he's like, yeah, I do Bible talk every day on my campus. And I have 12, 19 guests out at this Bible talk by himself. One man Bible talk. And I'm like, this math doesn't add up right here. But here's the thing. Built, sin has a built-in punishment, even for him. If he doesn't repent, at some point it catches up and it takes your faith away. Yeah. See, Achan sin is the lack of faith. That's the Achan sin. Yeah. Yeah. And so a lot of times we get superstitious and go on a sin hunt when we need to go on a soul hunt. Right. That's Corey Blackwell. I can't take credit for that. That's Corey. But, but that's what we got to go after. We got we to gotta win souls for Christ. Amen. All right. What about, lastly, not giving your missions? You ever, you ever think of the built-in punishment of not giving special missions contribution? Wow. I'm not talking about how God's going to, you know, curse you like it says Malachi and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about just the natural built-in punishment that comes from not being generous. Right. Yeah, come on, bro. What is it? Well, I, I was thinking about it. I think I just observed the built-in punishment is you get critical towards the church. Yeah. I think that's like the one consistent thing I've seen. Uh, the other built-in punishment is you get suspicious. The other built-in punishment uh, that happens is you stop, start missing meetings of the body. Because when you're not giving to something, it means you don't believe in it. And so one of the built-in punishments is you start to drift away from God. And you ever meet these people that come to church, they're like, oh, I visit that church. And the, the whole time the preacher preached about money, so I'm not coming back. I go, well, great. And don't let the door hit you on the way out. Amen? Like Jesus preached about money, guys. And these are the same people that don't want to be members of a church. Well, I just give by giving to the homeless shelter every week. That's my contribution. Well, you've never read the Bible, buddy. Because, yes, you should do that. But the Bible teaches that in 1 Corinthians 9, 14, we are to support our missionaries. Are you with me right here? And so don't be this person that gets critical. Well, I don't want to give under compulsion. You ever heard that one? One of my best friends fell away recently because of this, this garbage. And you go, well... I don't want to give under compulsion, so I'm not going to give because my heart's not right. I don't really feel like being pure today. You know, my heart's not really in the right place. So I'm just going to kind of indulge in impurity today, but once I get my heart right, then we'll go for it. You know, like the same people that I'm not going to take communion because so -so, I'm bitter at so and so. Do you get the point is actually to repent before you do that? Like, why would you add sin on sin? I never miss communion. That is a wicked sin. And then you bring on God's punishment of falling asleep, getting weak. You guys know that scripture. But, but bottom line is the built-in punishment is we add sin to sin. You're not supposed to give under compulsion. But that's your problem, not your preacher's. In fact, 1 Timothy 6 says the preacher is commanded to command the rich to be generous. And so you go, oh, man, this is making me feel pressure. Good. I feel pressure. We've got an entire world to evangelize. Paul felt for pressure. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. I face daily my pressure for my concern for all the churches. It's not unbiblical to feel pressure. It's unbiblical to give because you feel like you're doing it for people and not for God. But you can repent of that in a decision. doesn't mean it's not going to be hard. doesn't mean it's not going to hurt. But don't be one of these people. I don't feel like sharing my faith and my heart's not right, so I'm going to go let people go to hell. No, don't do that. Sometimes you got to obey the general's orders regardless of how you feel so that you don't add sin upon sin. Are you with me right here? All right, these people want to get baptized. Let me, let me finish this up here. 
You're like, I'm struggling because I'm not saved and you're talking forever, amen. <laughs> what about the sin of omission of, of not raising up? <laughs> now, I am inspired. You guys just had like the most radical transition I've ever heard of in my life. And uh, I go, wow, that's an incredible thing to send your leadership to go and supplement another church and to see the result is amazing. And then to see all the baptisms you guys are still having. I commend you guys. This church was built on Christ. But you know, the built-in punishment for seeing a need in deciding not to meet that need. See, how do you know if you're called? You go, is there a need? And can I meet that need? You're called by God. You're called by God. You know, the Bible says in Ezekiel that God's roaming the earth looking for someone who would stand in the gap on his behalf so that he doesn't have to punish the land. So that's not talking about built-in punishment. That's he has to punish. So he's going to punish the church if people don't step up. That's all another sermon. But what's the built-in punishment for you if you don't step up? You miss the destiny for which you were made for. And you might squeeze into heaven. But when I read the parable of the ten, ba the ten uh, bags of gold or the ten talents, I think it's a salvational issue. We need every member in this church to prayerfully consider how can I step up? How can I have a heart of clay and allow others to mold me to be more like Christ and teach and train me so we can replace the heroes that have gone before us? Are you with me right here? The built-in punishment of not doing it is Fernando suffers. And I don't want Fernando to suffer. That's a built-in punishment. I mean, you, you, I know it's like being a leader and you send out all your people and you're kind of like, you know, you need someone to lift your arms. I love the idea of, of built-in, and by the way, the, the points intermix together. I'm not like, we're not on point one still or anything. Don't worry about that. The built-in blessings are simply all the opposite of what we talked about. Pure relationships, sobriety, vision and clear thinking. Doesn't the Bible say in Philemon 1.6, when you share your faith, you get an understanding of every good thing? Don't you, when you sit in a study, it reminds you of the grace of God? Every Christian needs to be in a Bible study. And finally, the divine punishment of sin and the divine blessing of obeying the gospel. Maybe you're visiting and these sins have been in your life. I have good news for you. I have good news for you. Jesus died a brutal death to save you from these sins. He bled on the cross. But we need to understand, God has three deadlines. Three deadlines. One, either you die and you meet God. Two, Jesus returns, and then you meet God. Or three, your heart hardens, and you can never come back to God. The third one's one that we don't talk enough about. I'll quote Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. This implies that there can be a time where you can't find God. And you can't seek him. You say that? No, bro. Well, there's a sin in the Bible called the unforgivable sin. Blasting the Holy Spirit. Pharisees did it. Pharaoh in the Bible killed so many babies that God just goes, I'm done with you. We read in Romans 1, the reprobate, the person that continually gives into sin, and God's like, I'm done. Hebrews 6 talks about a falling away to where you can never come back. Yeah. So study this out on your own. Esau sought the blessing in Hebrews 12 with tears, but couldn't find repentance because he insulted the inheritance and the blessing of God through which the lineage of Christ would come from. This service could be your last chance to become a Christian because you could walk out those doors and forever have a hard heart. It's not that God doesn't want you to come back. It's that you've hardened yourself so much. And that looks different for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen murderers become Christians. Yeah. I've seen other people that struggle with what we'd call small sins harden their heart. And only God knows. And I want to inspire you. If you're here today, that is most likely not you. 
You have a chance. Yeah. But one of these three deadlines will come. come Today, I want to give you the call. Write down a list of your personal sins that you're either giving into or struggling with right now. On, and have a quiet time and really think about what are the built-in punishments of these sins that I'm engaging in right now. And I believe with all my heart then that we'll repent of these sins. We'll start experiencing the built-in blessings of righteousness, amen. But let's take warning today of sin's dire consequences and to God be the glory.